Hello maths fans, Dr Tom Crawford here at the University of Oxford and today we're looking at the subspace test. In the previous video from the Oxford Linear Algebra series we looked at the vector space axiom, a list of rules that must be satisfied for something to be called a vector space. Common examples are the n by n matrices and Rn which consists of vectors with n real entries. Now once we know an object is a vector space, a natural question to ask is whether it is the smallest such vector space. In other words, can we make it smaller without breaking any of the vector space axioms? This is where the concept of a subspace comes in. A subspace, let's call it U, is itself a vector space and therefore must satisfy all of the vector space axioms. But because we know that U is contained in the larger vector space V, it will automatically inherit a lot of the required properties. In fact, there are only three things that we need to check which gives the following definition. Suppose we have a vector space V and we have a set U contained in V, so U contained in V is a subspace provided the following are satisfied. One, we need U to be non-empty. There has to be something within our subspace. So U is non-empty. The second property that we require is that our subspace U must be closed under addition. So what this is saying is if we have two elements in U, which remember is contained in the larger space V, if we have two elements in U and we add them together, then we stay inside our set U. That's what it means to be closed under addition. And our third rule is to say that U must be closed under scalar multiplication. So this means if we take a vector inside U and then we multiply by a scalar, usually we refer to this as lambda, if we multiply by lambda then we get something which is still within our set U. When checking these properties, which we will do shortly with some simple examples, it's actually more helpful to think about them algebraically because it gives us an equation or it gives us a statement which we can check mathematically. So the first one, reasonably straightforward, if it's not empty, that says there exists some vector, let's call it lowercase u, and that belongs to our set, which we're hoping to show is a subspace capital U. So there has to be something. That something can be zero. The zero vector is an object and therefore would mean that our set was non-empty. So that is okay, but we do need something within that set. The second one, saying that it is closed under addition, that means that if we take, let's call them u1 and u2 belonging to our space capital U, then that's telling us we expect u1 plus u2 to also belong to the space U. This is what it means to be closed under addition. You may recognize this or something very similar to this from the previous discussion in the video before this one where we looked at the full vector space axioms. And this one again is going to look quite similar, this third one, because this says for a lambda, um, and again, I'm gonna take the real numbers for our scalar field. It could be a more general field but given I focused on the reals when doing the vector space axioms, I'm gonna do the same thing here. So if we have a real number lambda, then what this is saying is lambda 
times u also belongs to u, where the vector u was in our space in the first place. So multiplying by any real number still gives us something inside our set u. And if all three of these are satisfied for this set u contained in the larger vector space v, then we can say that u is indeed a subspace. So if we start with some simple examples, also known as trivial examples, because they will in fact always be true no matter what vector space v we are working in, then a subspace could be to take the whole space. So eg1 would be if my subspace u was actually just the whole vector space v, technically that is indeed contained in the larger space v, but I'm taking the whole thing, then clearly it is not empty. We can also see it's closed under addition precisely because v was closed under addition by definition of being a vector space. And similarly, it's going to be closed under scalar multiplication. So this is a very trivial example, but it is an example of something which technically is a subspace. Now a second also trivial example, because again, it will be true for any vector space V, is actually to take U to be just the zero vector from that larger space V. So we have a vector space V, it's well-defined, it satisfies all of the vector space axioms. And so that means that there exists a zero vector within V. If we just take the zero vector and nothing else, this will in fact be a subspace. To check this is a subspace, we just have to make sure it satisfies these three properties in our definition of being a subspace. So first of all, is this non-empty? Well, we have zero. Zero is an element. So therefore, it is indeed non-empty. There is at least one element. In fact, there's exactly one. But there is at least one element in our set. So this one works. Is it closed under addition? Well, the only thing we have is zero. So if I were to take an element within my subspace, all I can do is zero, and I take another one, then I've got zero plus zero, which is zero, which definitely belongs to u. So again, this is why we call it a trivial subspace, because it's kind of trivially true that adding zero to itself gives you zero, but it does mean that our second rule is satisfied. And then finally, if we do lambda times zero, and again, we have to have zero because we can take any general vector, lowercase u, but here all we have is zero. So we know exactly what that vector has to be. But a scalar multiple of zero, well, that's always zero for all lambda. So that also always belongs to u because we just keep getting back the exact same single entry that's in our subspace. But it does mean that this satisfies all three properties Again, these are the trivial examples. They will always be true for any vector space V, but it does give us our first few examples of things that are subspaces and that we can see satisfy the three properties or the three rules required by the subspace definition. For some more examples, including non-trivial ones, I do recommend heading over to ProPrep and having a go at some of the practice exercises on the topic of subspaces. ProPrep is an online resource that provides customized tutorials for students looking to improve their skills in STEM-based subjects, as well as a series of online lectures covering the vector space axioms and examples of subspaces. There are numerous exercises which are a great way to put into practice what you've been learning. Each exercise comes with a fully worked video solution, so not only can you check your answer, but you can see exactly where you may have gone wrong. Sign up now using the link in the video description for a 30-day free trial courtesy of Tom Rocks Maths. So far, we've defined what a subspace is via a series of three properties that a subset U contained in a vector space V must satisfy. 
and we've seen how checking these rules allows us to determine whether or not we indeed have a subspace. Now the subspace test allows us to expedite this process by instead only checking two simple properties. So the subspace test says the following, U contained in V, where V is a vector space, we can say that this is a subspace, is a subspace provided one, we need the zero vector to be in U. So property one, zero belongs to U. And property two is going to combine these two. So it says that lambda u1 plus u2 belongs to u and this is put in brackets for lambda being a scalar and u1 and u2 belonging to our set capital U. Now not only does the subspace test only give us two things to check instead of three, it actually gives us slightly easier things to think about. So we just have to identify the zero element and we can take any linear combination of two vectors from our set U. If we can show both of those two things are still within our space U, then we can conclude that we have a subspace. Now, before I go through some examples using the subspace test to show you why this is actually more straightforward than using the full definition, it is worth checking, and this is a very, very important thing for us to check, that these two definitions are equivalent. Because this is the formal definition of a subspace. This is what we want to use as a test clue is in the name, as a test to see if what we have is a subspace. So we want to make sure that checking one is exactly the same as checking the other. And so what that means here is showing they are equivalent statements. So in order to prove that they are equivalent statements, we need to start from one of them, let's say the subspace test, assume the subspace test is true, and show that implies that the definition holds. And we need to go in the other direction. We need to start by assuming the definition holds and show that implies that the subspace test is true. Because then we have a two-way implication and therefore can conclude they are equivalent. And so we only ever need to check this one to be able to get that with the thing we have is a subspace. Let's start by assuming that the subspace test is true and try to show the definition holds. So if I say assume subspace test holds, then these two things are true. That's our assumption. We now need to show one, two, and three are satisfied. So the first one, number one, and this is lowercase i, so lowercase will correspond to the definition and uppercase is the test. So lowercase i, u is non-empty. Well, according to the subspace test property capital I, we have that zero belongs to it. So it's clearly non-empty, zero belongs to u, so non-empty. So one is definitely satisfied. Two, U is closed under addition. Now, if you remember, we said that meant that U1 plus U2 belonged to U. Now, we have something very similar in our subspace test, but we have that this is true for any real number lambda. So all we do is take lambda is one. So for the second one here, we just say, well, take lambda equals one, then by number two in the subspace test, this property here, we can say u1 times one 
plus u2 belongs to u, which is exactly what we needed to satisfy that u was closed under addition. And then third, we need that u is closed under scalar multiplication. So what we do for that one, number three, is again, we use property two combined with property one, because we know that property two holds by the subspace test. In property two, we have lambda times something in our space plus something else in our space. And this is true for any choice of lambda u1 or u2. So what we do is we pick u2 to be zero. And we know that zero is in the space u precisely from property one. So take u2 equals naught, which again, we know belongs to u by property one. And then what we've got is lambda u1 then by two, we've got lambda u1 belongs to u for any choice of lambda. And again, to be closed under scalar multiplication, that just meant lambda times u had to be in our space u, which is exactly what we've got. So three is also satisfied. So starting by assuming the subspace test holds, assuming this works, so this is what we would check, I'm trying to show something is a subspace. Assuming this holds, we've been able to show that one, two, and three from our definition are all satisfied. So now we just need to go in the other direction. We start by assuming that U is a subspace according to the definition, and we want to show that properties one and two, these capital I properties in the subspace test, we want to show that they follow from lowercase one, two, and three. So if we now start by saying, assume U is a subspace. So in other words, one, two, and three are now true. Then we want to, first of all, get property one. So we want to think about how can we show that zero belongs to U? Well, from non-empty, first of all, so by property one, U is not empty. So we can say there exists U belonging to our subspace, capital U. But we also know that it's closed under scalar multiplication. So you say, and by property three, zero, which is a valid choice for our lambda, zero times u, which is of course zero, we know that belongs to u by property three. So that actually gives us therefore that one holds true. We've been able to show that zero is part of our subspace, which was the first part of the subspace test. Now for part two of the subspace test, we need to get lambda times u1 plus u2 is in our space whenever I pick u1 and u2 to be any vectors within u and lambda to be a scalar. So there's a big clue here in lambda being a scalar that I want to start with property three. So what we can say is, to try and prove number two, by property three, we know that for any vector within my space u, I can multiply by lambda and still get something within that vector space. So I want to take u1, so I can say lambda u1 belongs to u for any vector u1, which is exactly what's going on here. So I have the first piece is within my set. Now, we also have that it's closed under addition, and this closure under addition in its most general context says, take one piece in my space, add it to another piece in my space, and I stay in my space U. So this is one piece, this definitely belongs to U. So if we also take U2 belonging to U, that's just another general vector within U, these are now my two pieces. Both of them are in the space U, and therefore, by property two, 
we know the space is closed under addition, so we can add these two pieces together. So lambda u1 plus u2 is also in the space, and that is exactly what we wanted for part two of the subspace test. So I can give that one a big tick, and we've been able to show both parts one and parts two follow by assuming the definition of a subspace. Now we know that the subspace test as written here is equivalent to the definition of being a subspace, we can actually use this in practice to test whether or not a subset U is indeed a true subspace. So I'm gonna go through three examples in total and there are plenty more available through the exercises from ProPrep. So the first example, let's take our vector space V to be R3. So we have a three dimensional coordinate. So as an example, if we take a lowercase v as a vector, it would be x, y, z. A vector with three real entries. And I'm going to claim that u equal to r2 is a subspace. So in order to prove this, we just need to check that u coordinate vectors in the x, y plane satisfy parts one and parts two of our subspace test. So we'll start, like we did here, of saying a general vector u would just be x, y, and there would always be a zero in that z coordinate because this is just the x, y plane. So, number one, we need to check, does zero, the zero vector in this situation, does it belong to R2? Well, what is zero within our vector space? If we're working in 3D coordinates, zero is the origin, naught, naught, naught. So we know that the zero vector is the origin, zero, 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 which very clearly belongs to R2. We just take x is equal to naught and y is equal to naught. So that clearly works. And now for number two, we just need to check that a multiple of something in the xy plane plus something else in the xy plane is still within the xy plane. So what that's gonna mean here for number two, for example, is if I have x1, y1, and zero, and that's multiplied by lambda. So this is a general element in the xy plane, scalar lambda. So that's lambda u1, and I add that to something else, in the xy planes, let's call it x2, y2, zero. Then what I get using my properties of vectors, which hopefully we're all familiar with, lambda goes all the way through, and then we add up the first coordinates and we add up the second coordinates. So we're gonna end up with here, lambda x1 plus x2, comma, lambda y1 plus y2, comma, zero. So this whole thing, we've still got an x coordinate, we've still got a y coordinate, and z's still naught. So this very clearly still belongs to R2, which is our subspace now, U. And I can say subspace because one and two are satisfied. So the Cartesian plane, the xy plane, is indeed a true subspace of the larger vector space of three-dimensional coordinates. I'll just add a note here to say that there was nothing special about me picking a dimension of two for my subspace. This could have been dimension one and follows pretty much the exact same kind of argument. You can show that the real numbers also constitute a subspace. And again, you could replace this with Rn and then you can put here Rm where m can be any number from one up to n minus one. So in other words, if you have n coordinate vectors, so with lots and lots of entries up to the nth position, n coordinate vectors, and you take a subset, a smaller subset of those vectors where we have fewer 
dimensions, so you make some of the ones towards the end zero, then you're going to get a subspace. So most subspaces that you will come across do in fact take this form, mainly because the canonical example of a vector space is indeed r to the n, and you will see this come up several times when you're working through the pro prep exercises. Let's now look at a more general example as follows. So let's suppose we have a vector space V. So this is our large space, which everything is contained within. And we also have U and W are both subspaces already. This is given they're going to be subspaces of V. Then what we can say, or what we're going to prove to be true, is that the intersection, so U intersect W, is also a subspace. Is a subspace of V. So if we have two subspaces, which can be anything inside a larger space V, then the intersection of those two subspaces is itself a subspace. So it's a little more abstract, a little more general, but it's very helpful for constructing subspaces for more general vector spaces. So in order to prove this, we again are going to use the subspace test and check whether or not these two things are true. So number one, we need the zero vector to be within the intersection. So here, this relies on the fact that U itself is a subspace. So U is a subspace, and so therefore U satisfies the subspace test. So this is using that equivalence relation in the opposite direction. So because we're told U is a subspace, it satisfies the subspace test, and therefore zero is in U. So U is a subspace tells us that zero belongs to U. W is a subspace in exactly the same way. That's going to tell us that zero belongs to W. So we have zero in U, zero in W. Therefore, zero is indeed in the intersection. And so we have part one. So these two together, if something is in both sets. It must be in the intersection because this means U and W. So zero is in the intersection. Zero is in U and W. So that gives us number one. Now for two, we need to show that a linear combination of elements in the subspace remains in the subspace. So what we can do here is start by saying take v1 and v2 belonging to the subspace, which is the intersection of u and w. Now, because these two vectors are in the intersection, what we can conclude, and we have actually a choice here, is we can say, well, if they're in the intersection, they're therefore in u and w, so they're definitely in u. So v1 and v2 belong to u. And equally, we could replace this with w, but it doesn't really matter, because we can show that v1 and v2 are in u because they're in the intersection. So if they're in both u and w, they're definitely in u. But u is a subspace. u is a subspace. So what do we know about subspaces? Subspaces are closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. And we've also previously shown that those two things allow us to deduce number two for the space u. So because u is a subspace, number two is satisfied for elements in u, is true for elements in u. And we've already got two elements, v1 and v2, so therefore lambda v1 plus v2 is in u because it's a subspace, but we could also go through and do the exact same for w. So if I take a different color, we can just say, well, this is true for W, 
W is a subspace. So this is true for elements in W. So therefore this is also in W. So we just repeat this twice, once by taking V1 and V2 belonging to U. And then the exact same elements are also in W because of this intersection, which means the two of them and U and W. So we've got that both of them are in U because it's a subspace, the combination is. Both of them are in W because it's a subspace, the combination is. Therefore, putting it all together, so overall, we've actually shown lambda v1 plus v2 belongs to u intersect w, which is what we were trying to get to satisfy number two. And therefore, the whole subspace test is true. And we can conclude that u intersect w is indeed a subspace. Our third and final example comes from a completely different vector space, which we haven't yet met, but we will discuss more in some of the upcoming videos in the Oxford Linear Algebra series. So do keep your eyes peeled for those. But what we're going to look at is the following. Example three, we take V to be equal to R to the power R, or R superscript. R is how I should state this. Now what this means, this is defined to be functions which map from R into the real numbers. So the sort of full size R here represents your starting space and you're mapping into the reals. So RR means functions, any function that's mapping from the real numbers and gives you an output in the real numbers. Now, I'm not going to show this is a vector space. That can be a exercise for the viewer. So go back if you need a reminder and watch the previous video looking at the vector space axioms and you can check that this space functions mapping from the reals to the reals will indeed give you a vector space. What I'm going to claim here is that u, which is going to equal the differentiable functions differentiable functions within this space, which map from R to R. I'm going to claim that U is a subspace. So the full vector space is any function that you can think of, and you can literally make one up on the spot. Any function which maps from the real numbers to the reals, that would be the vector space V. The subspace U, or what I claim as a subspace, is just the differentiable functions within that larger set. So we proceed in the same way. We check that we satisfy the subspace test. So property one, we need zero to belong to u. So the zero function, some of you may have thought about this before, but I'm sure some of you haven't. The zero function basically takes any input and outputs zero. So f of anything, so the zero function, if you think about what that would mean, it would just mean f of any input, any real number is equal to zero. Whatever you put in, you just get zero, maps everything to zero. That is going to be our zero function. Is that differentiable? What is the derivative of zero? It's zero. So it is actually going to be differentiable. So this is differentiable differentiable and the derivative is just zero because it's a constant function and we know constants have zero derivative. So it has a derivative, therefore it's differentiable and therefore belongs to u. So number one is satisfied. And then number two, we now suppose we have f and g are differentiable. So that means they belong to u. The definition of being in U means you are a differentiable function. So then we form this combination. So if F and G are differentiable, then lambda F plus G. What is the derivative of that? Well, we just use our rules of differentiation. So if I want to differentiate lambda F plus G, where F and G are differentiable, they belong to the space U, 
so their derivatives exist, then if I just apply a simple linearity of derivatives, that's just lambda f prime plus g prime. So that is a well-defined derivative because both f prime and g prime exist, they're differentiable. So the linear combination has a derivative and so therefore number two holds. And as we've seen many times before, if one and two hold in the subspace test, our conclusion is that u, the differentiable functions from the reals to the reals, is indeed a subspace of all functions mapping from the reals to the reals. For more exercises and to recap the content covered in today's video, be sure to check out ProPrep and discover their amazing collection of tutorial videos designed to help you to improve your math skills. Just click the link in the video description to get your free 30-day trial. Thank you everyone for watching. Please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.